My brothers and sisters, good morning. Sounds a little better. My brothers and sisters, good morning. Good morning. And I wondered as I listened to the singing and our responses, whether any of us here, if you have ever been to carnival, has anybody here, oh no, some people on the right would say yes. Or have we ever been to a gospel concert? And, and what is the difference between that and this morning? Can we then sing an old Anglican chorus that will get us into that context of thanking God that we are alive today? Something in my heart like a stream running down. It makes me feel so happy. As happy as can be when I think of Jesus and what he has done for me. Oh, something in my heart like a street. One more time. Once more. Something in my heart like a stream running. It makes me feel so happy. When I think, something in my heart, like a stream running down. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we give you thanks for this new day, a day that we have never seen before. We thank you for the gift of life today. And as we focus on you being our good shepherd, as we celebrate mothers, biological and other, we ask you, Lord, to enter our spirits and give us that warmth that we may reflect the image of who you are to the world. So Lord, speak to us. Let us hear you calling us by name. Speak to you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Comforter and Liberator. Amen. This morning, I'd like to share with you under the theme, Belonging Matters. Belonging Matters. Human beings have an instinctive need to belong. And if we were ever in doubt, the pandemic has shown us that this is so. Group relationships according to Sally Boardman lead, leads to an increased level of survival. Her perspective resonates with several persons, including the psychologist Maslow, who places the need for belonging very high on his framework of hierarchy of needs. Our collect for today, which is found on page 169, which I invite you to, to find at this time, pulls us towards the image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd and instinctively creates of us a group, the sheepfold. So today we are, we are the sheep, as we have always been, but we are focusing on it. And today we are a group of sheep, and we're a group of mothers, and we're a group of Christians. We belong to those three groups, and we belong to other groups, the Mother's Union, the WA, the Kiwanis, the Brotherhood, the Sunday School, the AYF, the choir, the care groups, the birthday groups. And so belonging is essential. So our collect, I'd like us to read it together. Our priest read it, prayed it this morning, but please let's do it together now. On page 169. Oh God, whose son, 
Can't hear you. Let's go again. Oh God. Amen. The image of the shepherd reflects for the Christian the divine human relationship. The divine human relationship. And this is not an abstract concept because in our prayer that we just read, it says that he, the good shepherd calls us by what? Name. He calls us by name. Can you hear him calling? Let's listen. And we are expected to follow where the shepherd leads. One of the most powerful biblical images for one who cares is that of the shepherd, which is anchored in the Old Testament scripture and its Old Testament theology. Shepherds lead their sheep to places of nourishment and safety. Shepherds protect them from danger. And David Benner posits that shepherds are characterized by compassion. They are characterized by courage and a mixture of tenderness and toughness. Somehow, those characteristics could be reflected in a good Christian mother. So, as sheep that the shepherd calls us by name, we are connected to him. We are not, a, we are not strangers to him. And this connection has a condition. We have to follow where he leads. So one implication then is that there is, following the shepherd speaks to a journey. Our collect hints at the concept of belonging, and we can draw from that, that within the group, within the sheepfold, isolation, isolation and disconnection are not characteristics to be embraced by members of the shepherd fold, by members of the sheepfold. So look around. Look around in the congregation. Some persons we haven't seen for a while. We have some visitors, musicians of the highest order here in the audience. And look around at the persons that we should be connected to. And just examine ourselves. As I am doing, as I am speaking, how connected are we to the people around us? Do we even trust them? Do we trust them? But if we belong to a group, the expectation is that there is a certain level of trust. And in that trust, the relationship grows. So here, in our gospel reading today, it picks up on the good shepherd image. And that pericope of the gospel reading follows Jesus' telling the hearers that he is the good shepherd. He spoke about his attributes as a good shepherd. At this great festival where lots of people were gathered, including the spiritual elites of the day, the spiritual leaders. And yet, we see that there was almost an attempt to floor him and embarrass him. So they had a question. And I'm sure that a number of persons in that audience must have had different kinds of questions. But the question that was specifically asked was about Jesus' identity 
and his claim to messiahship. Jesus' identity and his claim to messiahship. And you know, brothers and sisters, identity for us, particular Jamaicans, is a very important thing. Because we don't listen to certain people if we don't know their identity. We don't listen to certain people if we believe that they are nondescript. We don't listen to certain people, the people on the edges, the marginalized, because really and technically speaking, they are really nobodies. So here was the crowd trying to determine Jesus' identity, and he had performed so many miracles before. He had done many signs and wonders, yet they still did not believe. They still did not believe. You see, the crowd, particularly the spiritual leaders, and I'm going to say that, the scripture doesn't say that, but based on the pattern of the scriptural leaders of the day, they had a certain aloofness about them. They had a certain kind of self-importance about them. And in a sense, they were not connected to the ordinary and the everyday people of life. They kept the law. And even although Jesus came with a different kind of message, a message of grace, they could not accommodate it because they were sticking to the law. And so we have several people in that crowd while that question was being asked. There were some persons who wanted to hear the truth without committing to trust. There were those who wanted to experience certainty without taking any risk at all. There were those who were stuck in their old ways of thinking, so they were unable to see the new ways that Jesus was speaking. Oh God, they were trapped. They were trapped in the vestiges and practices of the law. And this entrapment discouraged them from seeing and recognizing grace. To be fair though, I believe that there would have been some people in that crowd who were open to new possibilities, maybe in their heads, but the journey didn't make it from the head to the heart. So the energy of that crowd may not have been positive. And as we think about those statements, I would like to, us to think not casting a judgment, just to think which one of the statements would fit us. Which one of the groups we would fall in? Would we fall into the group that wanted to hear the truth, but we weren't ready to commit to trusting? Would we fall into the group that wanted to experience the certainty of who this man was without taking any risk of following him? Are we in the group where we are stuck in our old ways of thinking? And so although all over the world and in various places we are talking about re-imaging and re-imagining, we cannot re-image and imagine because we're not opening ourselves and availing ourselves to this new grace. Which one of the groups would we belong to? And I think maybe from time to time, many of us would fall, including many of us would fall in a number of the groups. So it was in this kind of environment that the question was asked, how long will you keep us in suspense? How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly, In a sense, the speakers in the crowd used a strategy 
of coercion and manipulation. And I want to say this very clearly. They used a strategy of coercion and manipulation, which is being practiced by our leaders today in the church and in society. That's what they were practicing. So let us gather now and get our own way. Because it's my way or the highway. We are not open to new ways. So in a sense, one could say that these persons were seeing and saying to the Messiah, stop talking in riddles. In the Jamaican parlance, we would say, there's no need to beat around the bush. Or we would say, talk straight. My brothers and sisters, on reflection, the thought occurred to me that so often we too ask questions of Jesus, questions of a similar nature. We may not use those words. Our situation at times may force us to ask God to stop hiding from us. Where are you? When we look at the spate of crime and violence in our country, we ask God, I ask him, God, where are you? Where are you? Why are you hiding from us? Can this continue? The latest situation I heard on the news, which I hardly listened to, was a man went about to do his business. He was going to get married sometime this week. And he went about his legitimate business in Mandeville. And thieves robbed him. And then pointed to him as a thief. And the citizens, along with civil society, beat that man to death. When the thieves were happily laughing. Because they were the thieves. This is the kind of violence. Where is God? So sometimes we face situations that force us to ask, why is God hiding from us? When we pray and our prayers are not answered the way we want, sometimes we say, Lord, show us a sign. The answer Jesus gives is very telling. Show us a sign. Who are you? I remember Jesus asked that of his disciples later down, you know. Who do you say that I am? Jesus' response to the crowd was simply this. And it was not warm. You do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. What a sharp pronouncement. What a sharp pronouncement by our Lord. One of the features of this good shepherd is that he challenges people. He challenges people to be the best that they can be. You see, brothers and sisters, belonging matters. In this interchange, there is a suggestion that the journey of belonging leads to belief. When we belong, belief will follow. Belonging is an important pillar for relationship building and trust. So the question asked by the people in the crowd and its attendant attitude of suspense can convey a lack of trust. It can convey the sentiment that I can't trust you, nor am I willing to even listen to you. And I am not going to have the capacity to even learn from you. Debbie Thomas, a Christian writer says, that Jesus' reply might appear to suggest that belonging to him depends on believing in him. But in fact, Jesus is saying the opposite. 
you struggle to believe because you don't consent to belong. Belief or faith cannot grow first. We must belong to that shepherd. We must be a part of the sheepfold. Belonging to the sheepfold impacts our experiences in life. Belief in Jesus Christ will not come from intellectual acumen. There's a lot of bright talking now. You hear the politicians talk about who is bright and who is not bright. You hear it in the church. Who is bright and not is bright. It doesn't come from intellectual acumen. But from the mundane business of walking in the footsteps of the shepherd. Walking in the footsteps of the shepherd. So how do we believe? We walk in the footsteps of the shepherd. We live in the company of the fellowship. I don't want you to answer me this rhetorical question. Do we live in the fellowship and company of the fellowship? Some of us have been coming to this church for years and we talk to the same people every Sunday. We talk to the same set of persons every Sunday. There is no difference. We are not willing to go out and fellowship. I know of a person who came to this church a couple of years ago and she knows almost everybody by name. And some people do not know. And one of her beefs, some people do not know her name. Fellowship. Fellowship doesn't mean he he he. It means a deep and intimate bonding and building of trust and opening yourselves to be vulnerable to the other person. And then there's a third way that our belief in Jesus Christ grows as a shepherd. Listening in real time for the voice of the shepherd. Listening. That's a skill. Listen. Listening to the voice of the shepherd. Listening to the shepherd who takes us through the rocky hills of life, the hidden pastures of unexpected trails, the very low valleys of depression and anger and restlessness. But throughout all of this, the shepherd cares for us. And he sacrificed his life for us. And this sacrifice is an ultimate commitment of love. So we sing glibly sometimes, follow, follow, I will follow Jesus everywhere, everywhere. I will follow one and then somebody says to you, come with me down to St. Simon's. Well, you know, I really don't know down there. Um, <laughs> follow. And that's a physical place. But sometimes we're asked to follow people, follow Jesus, and help people to go through an immersed emotional journey. And we fall by the wayside because we are faint of heart. And one of the songs that come to mind as I think about following in his footsteps walking in his footsteps, living in the company of the fellow, fellow sheep, and listening in real time to God's voice is one song from Sister Act. You remember that song? It says, I will follow him. So beneath the shepherd's rod and staff, we are in constant earshot of his voice. Then our faith will grow, our belief and absolute trust in God is not instant. We go through several reiterations. Belonging first and then believing in him.
as we surrender to his care as a group, as we surrender to his authority as a group, as we surrender to his leadership as a group, as individuals and as a church and God's guidance. Belonging and believing give us the opportunity and the in the infinite greatness of God. Believe in Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, means that we lean to listen to him, to trust him. And sometimes we have to lean because he's whispering. So we have to lean a little closer to hear what God is saying to us, to depend on him. join our insides by our people's outsides. <coughs> Sisters and brothers, our good shepherd is not necessarily a formula creator or a formula giver. Our good shepherd is interested in our formation. Jesus is interested in the state and the growth of our souls. And so he leads, you see in his sermons, particularly in the Gospels, that Jesus converses. He communicates because he wants that conversion to flow from the heart into every sphere of our lives. A total eclipse of the heart. Let me see if I can remember. Bonnie, you know Bonnie Taylor's um, total eclipse of the heart? Church, I've lost you. Are you with me? You don't know that song? It's, it's a little old. It's my age group or some. Total eclipse of the Turn around, bright eyes. You know, John? Total eclipse of the heart. That's what God wants. Not a half-heartedness. Roy, you know that song. You have it in your collection. Yes. Total eclipse of the heart. The good shepherd. And that's what he's asking us this morning. So yes, we have come to celebrate Mother's Day. <laughs> but we must remember that we have to be formed by that shepherd. And those outside the security and safety of his hand, Sister Claudia, they are in jeopardy. Because when we are safe in his hand, no torment can touch us. And even when we die, scripture speaks about no torment touching the soul. So, my brothers and sisters, the good shepherd has a caring disposition. And care is essential for belonging to that group. Care is essential for belonging to this group. And I know, I know Sister Marcia and others have been talking about the kinds of care we offer as a congregation. What kind of care do we offer as individuals? How do we care for each other? The other persons in your sheepfold, I asked you to look around at them a while ago. How do you care for them? How do you care for your organist and your choir director and those who give us beautiful music on the choir every Sunday morning? How do you care for Sister Betty and Patrick and our students? How do you care for the leaders of our organizations? What kind of care do we offer to them? We are obligated to follow the care of the Good Shepherd who protects and walks with us. And so, I want to say that mothers, great mothers, provide and show this example, not only to their children, but to all the children that they meet. And the church ought to be that shepherd 
to all our children, all our people, and the people on the outside. What is the quality of our care? Which group this morning do this, we decide we would want to join? The people in the crowd? Or are we following the group that Jesus is leading? You see, when we establish caring relationships, trust ensues. And we have no need to exclude people because exclusion can cause irreparable damage. And sometimes it takes years to mend. Sometimes it doesn't, it is, it doesn't mend at all. So I ask you as I close, do you believe and do you belong to that good shepherd? who leads the sheep. If you believe, will you follow him? Follow, follow, I will follow you. Anywhere. I will follow. I will follow Jesus. I will follow. Let us stand as an act of commitment. And if you really mean it, let us sing it. And turn to your neighbor. We're not so close because of COVID. But turn to whoever is near to you and sing that. Follow, follow. I will follow. Thank you.